Hi, this is Tara Johnson, and welcome to This Is My Story, where we dive deep into the power of storytelling. I'm an author, a speaker, a PK, a wife, a mom, a musician. I usually have the microphone, but during This Is My Story, I turn the storytelling over to you. Whether it's a tale crafted by an author or the stories of how God has transformed lives, we want to learn, laugh, and grow together. Welcome to This Is My Story. So I just wanted to thank you because you were such an encouragement to me. I don't even know if you realize how much you encouraged me because I've had, well, it's five novels now, but only three historicals out. And I knew very few people. I knew Laura Franz and I had met with Robin Lee Hatcher and Sarah Sundin, and I knew very few other people. And when you read that story and posted such a kind, genuine review, Mm. it just absolutely gave me the bolster I needed to keep going because it's scary. Yes. It's so scary it releasing is. that first one. Releasing any story is scary, but that's the first one. There's so much fear that the enemy puts on your heart. So and you're so good about um, being an avid reader for other authors and promoting them. And you're such a good example. What, what, I mean, are you just a natural story lover or is that something that since you have got so many books out now, is that something you know that's innately needed? I am a story lover, but I also um, am an encourager. And I just love to find ways, and not that it's flattery ever. It's just like when there's a genuine thing that I see. Um, let me let me try that again. When there is something <laughs> that I see that I genuinely admire, I love being able to tell people about it. And because so much of this business, this publishing business, is word of mouth driven, um, yes. I I would love to think that maybe I can help other readers discover your books, Tara, or another author's books. Because I am not an author who writes four or five books a year. So I'm it's one a year, if that. And so yeah. my readers can be done with my book in a couple days and they're ready for more. And I'm like, well, you're going right. to have to wait for me, <laughs> but look at all these other books that are out there that you can genuinely love. So I just love yeah. doing that. Your next book just released or is about to release. I've got it in my Amazon cart, The Metropolitan the Affair. The Metropolitan Affair released in March. Mm-hmm. Okay, in March. All right, that's the one that's in my list. I told my husband if we could put some money in there, that'd be great. Oh, <laughs> I've got like five or six books that I've got. So <laughs> um, so what what number book is that for you that you have written? That was 20. That was wow. 20. But don't be that impressed because um, the first several books that I wrote were nonfiction for mm-hmm. the military community. Um, and several of those were co-written with other contributors or co-authors. So I have not written 20 novels and I have not written 20 books all by myself. But it is a nice <laughs> round number. So I did throw yes. a party. <laughs> I was fascinated. I was looking through your website right before we sat down to visit. And I love that you wrote for military wives in particular. Is that part of your story? Are you a military wife or are you in that world? Yes. I married a Coast Guard officer and he is no longer in the Coast Guard, but it was during my first year as a military wife that I was looking around for a devotional book written for military wives specifically, because I felt like there were so many things that were particular to my experience that translated really well um, biblically, like the idea of uh, our citizenship being in heaven. That Mm -hmm. was a truth that I really had to grasp, especially kind of looking down the line and thinking to myself that I was going to be moving every couple of years. And as an introvert, I thought that was going to be really hard for me to, you know, try to find community. So little things like that. Um, And we did not end up staying, he did not end up staying active duty for super long after we got married. So that was not my life story, but (laughs) it showed me that there are analogies to be made. And at the time there were not the resources out there. So I decided, um, that I would, I would pitch in and I would, um, do a devotional book. And I did draw in military wives from every other branch of service to contribute to it. 
Oh, that's great. I've got a friend, her, her husband, when I, I used to babysit her. Now she's grown with kids. So that makes me feel really old, but <laughs> she married um, a, a wonderful man who's part of the army and is still working. He's been in with them almost 20 years now, going close to 20 years. So, um, and he was over in Afghanistan. He was a sniper Wow. and their first year and a half of marriage, he was gone. So um, she was like, I was asking her, I said, Molly, what is it like? And she said, it is so hard and difficult because I worry so much. You already have that deep yearning just to be with your beloved that that first few years anyways. You're separated. It's nothing but worry. The phone calls come in at 3 a.m. And he came back on furlough and it was during the Halloween season. And so all of us loaded up to go on a scary hayride, not thinking. And she didn't even think that, you know, a sniper working yeah. in Afghanistan, not the prime place to be. And for him, um, nerve wise, and we were on there and people were jumping out and I just saw him tense. And I was like, oh, my friend, are you OK? He said, I will be OK. But she just said that never even entered my mind, but I'll never oh, forget man. it now. You know, so all those yeah. little things that you just don't think about until you live it. That's such a powerful That's right. ministry, I think. So so I'm glad that wasn't your whole life story, because, I mean, there's pluses and 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 hard things to that to that life right. for sure. Um, <laughs> much That's more right. hard and hard. Yes, but Very I'm difficult. grateful too that even though that was a that was a short chapter of my life, but it was enough to open my eyes to the need. And um, and I, you know, I really have so much respect and admiration for military families and um, being able to work with Dr. Gary Chapman on the Five Love Languages Military Edition mm. was like huge because they they do need, um, you know, specific guidance because like you were talking about, there are those extra challenges that a spouse may not think of that really affect how you relate to them, how you show them love. And it's different after there's been a deployment and a redeployment. Um, so what what really prompted your love of history? Can you trace it back or was there a moment in time? Um, you know, I've always been interested in story. And when I was growing up, the history classes were not all that interesting. And I think it's because they were just focused on dates and proper nouns and tariffs and tax, you know, like dusty right. textbook stuff. Yes. Um, but what really got me interested in the history that, you know, kind of birthed my fiction writing career was that I was in Gettysburg doing research for a nonfiction book, which was called Stories mm -hmm. of Faith and Courage from the Home Front. And mm -hmm. I was um, in these historical archives and I was reading through these uh, photocopies of letters written by Gettysburg housewives about what it was like to live during and after the battle. Like after all the armies left, they were there to pick up the pieces and put their lives back together. And I thought to myself, now this would make a really interesting historical fiction novel because yeah. I want to get into the emotion of the thing and like what all these ladies went through and didn't really talk about it, didn't really publish about it because that was considered unladylike. Um, so that was my, fr and at the time I thought, well, somebody else should do that. And then a couple weeks later, Moody Publishers, who was, I was contracted with them to do nonfiction for military. They said, we want to do more fiction, but with a military angle. What ideas do you have? And I had never written fiction before. Oh, wow. So I just shared with them some of the stories that I had uncovered in Gettysburg and we just kept talking and kept working with it. And that's what, um, grew into the heroines behind the lines civil war series it was really seeing the stories and the the full experience and the human condition um, that got me more and more into what generations before us have been through and it made me want to share that because as you know there's so much perspective to be had in looking at what our forebears have already been through i feel like every generation we think that we have it the worst yeah, we do. But, but we don't. I mean, we've there have been hard things in the past and people have overcome them and it's very inspirational to me. Is there yeah. a piece of research that that really shocked you when you have uncovered? Yes, and and this isn't um in the Civil War era, 
Uh, is that okay? It's like, it's oh, yeah, from that's anything. Books. Okay. Yes. So this has to do with my Chicago series. I knew I wanted to write yes. a series of three books set around three historic milestones in the life of Chicago as a city. So I knew about the Great Fire of Chicago of 1871. Mm -hmm. I knew about the World's Fair of 1893. And I needed a third and I had no idea. So I just Googled major historic milestones in Chicago timeline, mm -hmm. whatever. And then up popped the Eastland disaster. And if anyone is familiar with me in my writing, I'm sorry if this is repetitive for you, because I, <laughs> I feel like I've been talking about this for years, but someone's out there who hasn't heard about it. That's so right. That's just, right. I'll just give it a couple of sentences. Okay. Just the gist <laughs> of it. So the Eastland disaster took place July 24th, 1915. So, you know, we're recording this just in the beginning of August. So we just had the anniversary of it. But it was a steamship called the Eastland that was in the Chicago River right downtown. It was still tied to the docks. It was full of 2,500 people. They were Western Electric employees, mostly immigrant families, on their way to a picnic. They were going to sail across Lake Michigan. It was going to be the highlight of the year. The ship was not um, seaworthy, and it was overcrowded. It tipped over in the river, still tied to the docks, and 844 people lost their lives. I mean, that's huge, 844, and they were 20 oh, wow. feet from the shore, and they died, 844, and um, I, I'd i never heard about this before, and that's the kind yeah. of story where I, it just makes me say, wait a second, what happened, and yeah. why haven't I heard about this before? So Why has no one told it? Yeah. yeah. So in that case, that was an event where it was like, why haven't I heard about this before? But in some cases, it's a person, like, you know, a woman who did this amazing thing. Why haven't we heard about that before? So, I mean, okay, people have heard about the World's Fair before, and they have heard <laughs> about the Great Fire of Chicago before, but I kind of wanted to write those books in order to get to the Eastland disaster. Right. I'm very happy with how they all turned out, but oh, it was the fantastic. desire of my heart to get to the book that I felt people needed to hear about. They just just to honor the victims and the survivors. So yeah. that's one example. That That's so good. Yeah. And I, I commiserate with you there. My third book, I think it was the hardest to write, but I had never heard of the Knights of the Golden Circle. It blew my mind when I read what they had done during the Civil War. And I found a journal of one man who managed to escape and live to tell about it. And he detailed everything. And you talk about some nightmare inducing mm. research, but I'm like, that so needs to be told because we can't right. learn from our mistakes if we bury them or, you know, we refuse to bring the light exactly. to them. So, um, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I love, I, I loved uh, um, the, the very first one in that series about the Chicago fire. Um, the character she had, I'm trying to remember her name now. Um, Meg and Sylvie like, were the sisters. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I love their heart and their grit. And it seems like all of your stories go through um, highlighting just this innate courage. I, I love the word encouragement because basically mm. what it means is you're giving other people courage. Is that right. something you think about as you're writing or is it just what comes out of you? It is kind of. Um, a long time ago, when I first started writing, somebody at Moody said I needed a tagline. And so we came up with inspiring faith and courage. So yes. I I have not updated that. I hope that it still fits, but I do want to inspire faith and courage with everything I write. So I'm glad you picked up on that. Hooray. <laughs> it fits you. It totally does. Oh, I, I just, I love all of your characters and your stories have that, that, that beautiful thread running through all of them. And it, it just helps other people, you know, just lay folks as they're reading, like if this person can get through this mm -hmm. and deal with like the Chicago fire, these burns and the loss of a home and different things, you know, God's going to see me through my situation as well. So I I've got to know, like, who encouraged you as a child? Like, who did you love to read? Were you a big reader as, you, oh, yes. as a child? Weren't, I so. was a big reader. I think the first, um, the first book 
that I can remember that was categorized as Christian fiction, I think was Spunky's Diary. It's a dog okay. that wrote a diary. It was a Jeanette Oakey book before like oh, one calls the heart. Yeah. So I miss that one totally. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spunky's Diary, a, a dog diary. who ha can write in first person. Um, but then when we're talking about the first books that really opened my eyes to what stories could do, mm -hmm. um, I did enjoy the Mandy books and Grace Livingston Hill, but it was the Zion Covenant series by Brock and Bodie Taney. They're so good. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. Like blew my so mind. Good. I was in sixth grade when I read them for the first time. And uh, I mean, you it seems like you've read them too. So, you know, like yes. they are powerful. They're powerful. I was going to say they're dense, but I don't mean that in a bad way. They have a lot packed in. So it's the emotional journey and the personal journey, but there's enough history where I feel like I learned a lot. So yes. that was, that was the first series that really, really inspired me in terms of what books can do. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. No one has mentioned that when I've, or I've interviewed before oh, is, cool. is, is the Taney's. Um, yeah. Fabulous series. Um, it's one of those you, you don't realize it's almost at the end until you flip that last page and then there's morning because you're like, well, it's over. What, what am I going to do with my life now? So, <laughs> it's so hard. So um, yeah, that's fantastic. So if you could choose to sit down with anybody and just visit a, a former author, mm -hmm. like past, present, whatever, would it be the Taney's or is there somebody new that's just really captured your attention? That is a really good question. And I've been asked this before. So I've had a few years to think about it. Not that I've been thinking about it for years straight, but I think, so my answer changes all the time, but today I'm going to say Harper Lee. Oh yeah. She wrote Fantastic. To Kill a Mockingbird and it was the only book she published during her lifetime. Yeah. So I want to know why did she write that book and why mm -hmm. did she stop after that book? Um, you know, it's really intriguing to me because as you know, sometimes in this industry, it feels like you have to just crank them out like sausage, you know, at times. Yes. And I feel, yes. I feel like I'm nearing a very strong need for a sabbatical because it's, it's hard for me to be creative and passionate about different things and to meet all of these deadlines year after year after year after year. Um, so I'd love to sit and sit down with Harper Lee. And I want to ask her, did she, did writing that book, did publishing that book, what did it cost her in mm. terms of like personally, um, how did people react to that story in the time that it was published? Did she, did she exactly. lose relationships? Did she yeah. like, what's the story that we don't know? Because I'm sure you know this too, but when we take a stand for something, it has yeah. a cost. It so does. I want to know what it cost her and, and how she felt about it. And I want to encourage her, but you know, we're past that point. I don't need to <laughs> encourage Harper Lee, but if I could, I would. <laughs> Well, I mean, you've just echoed my thoughts perfectly. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird was the very first book that I sat down. I read as a senior in high school and I sat down and actually broke apart every line, really spots that really captured me and tried to figure out how it was she said so much and by saying so little. Yes. So I've, my original copy I still have here and it's got circles around things before I even knew that God was going to call me into writing. But it fascinated me. How could she show the angst of a soul with just five words? You know, yes. how did she do that? And you're exactly right. I constantly wondered, what did this cost her? Because mm. for my family, um, I was born in Oregon. My parents were born and raised in Oregon. We moved to the South when I was four years old. And I remember my parents being shocked by the racism. Oh. I mean, like she was, they were, they didn't think it really existed until okay. we moved down South for to have somebody born and raised. And I guess that's why I'm so passionate about writing those types of stories, because I was always taught that, you know, those who remain quiet are complicit. So we need to stand up and, and address these things, you know, but, um, but yeah, like you said, you, it feels like 
there are times when your brain just turns into a hacky sack because you don't even know anymore. Not that you said that, that's me. That's <laughs> terrible. But, um, but you get, you get on, on this wheel of production and after a while your heart's like, okay, what is it that's really inspiring me? What do I really want to say yes. other than just meeting this deadline? Um, and that's kind of where I am right now. I'm in between contracts and there's a story that God gave, gave me last year and my agent said, no one's going to buy it. It's just too controversial. And it's mm-hmm. about the Irish slave trade. And I told her and I said, well, can I self-publish it? And she said, yeah, you can do that. So we're going to self-publish it early next year. I'm getting ready to have it, a final edit done on it and get ready to get it sent out. But um, that's but amazing. That's amazing. I, I if you need an endorser, like send it to me. I would gladly do that. So <laughs> I would. And if you can't endorse it, you're like, no. But yeah, you think about these things. What is it going to cost me? Like, yeah. What What do you have thinking long term? What's something that you would really love to write about? You're not sure if you ever will, but you would love to write about it. Yeah, that is another good question. Um, I, I would love to go back and write um, something set during the revolutionary period mm. of our history and something else that's really intriguing to me. I don't know if I'm smart enough to write. Maybe I should just read a bunch about it instead and enjoy <laughs> other people's books. But the medieval time is fascinating oh, to me. Yeah. I used to think I would like to write about the bubonic plague. And then COVID hit and I was like, I'm done with plagues. I do not need to write about it. However, it was such an earth changing event. Maybe it would be worth writing about the aftermath about how like, you know, the social classes changed and women were given more opportunities because a lot of the men had died. Um, It's very sad. What a great idea. But maybe I should just read about it. (laughs) It sounds hard. (laughs) <laughs> but you know, I didn't think I would enjoy reading about it, but our book club just read Hamnet. Oh, I um, love that Daniel book. Carol, oh. And it brought, I was like, oh my goodness. I, I get it. All, Cause before, you know, you think of it almost analytically like a textbook, the black death and we know it killed it. And this is what caused it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But to see it just not a book about that, right. but see it woven into a story. I thought that was, fa- I cried, you know, oh, it was yeah. fascinating. because so, it was yeah. personal. So yes. like, we're not writing about the black death, like you said, but we're writing about a person or a family and how they dealt with this historical event. But I am yeah. so excited about you writing a book about the Irish slavery. I was just thinking about that yesterday. And I was thinking, where oh, are the cool. books on this? It was yesterday. I can't believe it. So yeah. I'll be praying for you. And I want oh, to mention another thing. Um, when I was first married, we moved from Washington, D.C. to Alaska. So I used Mm -hmm. to work on Capitol Hill and then I was unemployed and I was a new wife. And I thought, well, my husband's at sea. I don't have kids yet. I don't even at the time, I didn't even have a dog. So I'm like, this would be a good time for me to write a book. I've got time. (laughs) And then um, I so I was a journalist and I was a member of the Evangelical Press Association. And um, I got a newsletter and one of the articles talked about the danger of writing when we have nothing to say. Mm. Oh, that struck me. That struck me. So I'm at the point now in my career where I am really asking myself, what is it that really matters? What what do I want to say? Is there anything that I want to say? Is there anything left? I'm sure that there is. But like I said, I think I need a break. (laughs) (laughs) I need to recharge and refuel and, you know, smell the roses, but, That's right. <laughs> but that is the question. What is it that matters and what do I want to say? And I have no idea what century it that form, I have no idea what century that story will end up being in, but I, I just tell God I'm available if he wants to speak through me. But I also know that there's zero job security in this business either. So like I I hold this this dream of writing loosely in my hands and I offer it back to him all the time. And that really helps me to um, brace myself for 
big changes and shifts that, you know, a lot of this, Tara, is not up to us, is it? Like we can, no. we can write an amazing story and it can win awards, but it still might not sell. And if, right. if we don't have book sales, exactly. we don't get another contract. So there's only so exactly. much we can do. So, right. you know, it really is something to, to offer up to God and just remember, um, writing is a good thing, but it's not the best thing. God is the best thing. Exactly. And I need to not love my own writing more than I love God's will for my life. What is God's will? And and I'm in this particular season right now. Seasons change. I don't know when it's going to change. Yeah. So. What we want now, and we just so easily get off focus, you know, mm -hmm. and, and writers, like hyper creatives, I think are some of the worst at that because they yeah. feel like, well, what's the point of, um, of using this gift if I can't get it out there? Well, there's lots of other reasons we can't, we can't see. God showed me something very powerfully not long ago. Um, I, you know, you're told as an author, post on social media, you want readers to be connected to you. And so I've got friends that say, why are you still on Facebook? Well, that's where my readers are. So I stay on Facebook, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I just posted, I thought I need to post something today before I start my, my real work. And that's writing, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I sat down and nothing was really striking me um, in particular, nothing profound. So mm -hmm. I just wrote, Jesus wants you just as you are. Mm -hmm. I was like, great, done. Got off, began writing. I got a message like two or three weeks later that said, you're because of your writing, I gave my life to Christ. And I was thinking, which book, what, what are you talking about? This is amazing. She said, no, no, no. It was that, it's that thing you posted on Facebook about, I've been fighting God for oh 20, over 20 years <gasps> about needing to get it together first before I totally give up control to him. And that just hit me between the eyes. And I thought, here I am, thought wow. I was working on the important thing. Wow. And just, just speaking a simple truth was what God used. So you never know. You, you know, never do. You just, you can't ever tell. And it's just, just trying to be faithful and figure out what he's wanting you to do for the day. That's you know? amazing. And it's humbling. Yes. And boy, does that ever tell me to always be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it really knocked me back. And I, it took me a few months to process it. I didn't even tell anybody for a long Aww. time because I was like, wow. And here, this other thing that I think is so important was not the most important thing that day, you know? <laughs> so it just, it just, God is, God is good. And he uses us despite our, our goofiness sometimes. Yes, so. <laughs> he does. So, so a possible sabbatical coming up for you, huh? <laughs> well, you get I mean, I haven't really talked to very many people about it, but now it's out there. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm coming to, I'm rewriting the second book in my current contracted series. And then I have to write the third book in the series. Right. And I don't have another contract in the works after that. And that's why yeah. I think like, maybe I'll just take a little bit of time between this series and whatever is next, because, um, I just feel like maybe I want to. Well, I can't wait. Um, and you've got a, a Civil War. Is it a rewrite or a, 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 is it brand new? No. Okay. So I have a little postcard here. There we go. A River Between Us. Oh, a River beautiful. Between Us. So it was a novella in a barber collection in 2017. Right. And then... It, um, that went out of print and I got the rights back to it. I was never satisfied with what I did with it as a novella because I have too many words and the story was too big to cram into 35,000 mm. words. So I decided yeah. to expand it and now it is um, 84,000 words. I, I happen to have it on a post-it note right here <laughs> <laughs> because I'm working with two narrators to do the audio book. And so I had to oh, do nice. it like... The female has 50,000 words and the male has 34,000 words. <laughs> anyway, yes, I expanded it and it is now the story that I I wanted it to be. That novella was like the only time I've turned in a book and I really wasn't proud of it. And that was a horrible mm. feeling. So yeah. that was 2017. Now this is publishing in October 2023. That only took six years to get right. <laughs> And this actually may be contributing to my desire for a sabbatical because working on my regularly contracted stuff plus doing this, plus getting I, done, don't, yeah. I don't know how these other authors do it who do like my friends, Kimberly Woodhouse and Tracy Peterson and Jamie Jo Wright. They're just like, 
so oh, prolific. Like cranking it out. They yeah. are so, and Jody Hedlund, I talked with her on the phone just a few months back and, and about self-publishing. Cause I said, I see right. myself probably being hybrid eventually. Right. And she was like, she's like, yeah, I can usually crank out. She said this year I had a, I had a pretty good year. I got out seven. And I'm like, <gasps> seven stories, half of them traditional, half of them self-published. And I said, my brain would be absolute. I, I wouldn't know which characters went with what story. No you know, I, I would get everything mixed up. The most I've ever done at the same time is two. Mm -hmm. And that is a stretch. So, yep. um, cause I, I, once I get started on something, I want to finish it. I'm a, what the Myers-Briggs call it the INFJ. I got that J. I want to get that thing checked off the list, yep. you know, cause it gives me that, that dopamine hit. So having, two or three or four projects wide open. I, said, it makes I know. Me nervous, so. I don't know how they do it, but yeah. So does it take you, you said roughly about a year from completely the start to the finish or yeah, a little less? I mean, it's kind of hard to calculate. I, I know it takes me several months of research and I always go long on the research because I always think that I need more information or if this, if the plot isn't coming together, it's because I haven't done enough research. And then yeah. I usually take about three months to write the rough draft. And that's, that's a real crunch for me. Like I, I would like to have more time, but that's my own fault because I'm spending so much time on the research. Um, <laughs> that's me. So, but from the time I have the idea to the time I turn it in, it's usually about a year. And then with Bethany yeah. House, from the time I turn it in to the time it's published, we have four or five rounds of back and forth and that right. takes it another year. So it's a, it's a yeah. long process. It, it is. I'm, I'm starting, I'm hoping, hoping I would like to get to where I'm writing a book like every seven months. So I'm starting oh, wow. next month. I'm starting a new one um, about based on the life of Kate Warren. She was Pinkerton's first female detective. Oh, nice. You talk about the great Chicago fire. I'm having trouble finding research because all of the records about her burned up in the great Chicago fire. So Aww. I'm going to have to do a lot of imagining yep. <laughs> it's going to be more fiction probably <laughs> than reality. But, um, but yeah, I thought, man, if I could get it down to seven months, I would feel like that is, that is an accomplishment, but I'm scared that the, uh, the research might suffer a little bit. So, and you're always going to find people out there. They're like, especially when it's civil war, 1880s, they're like, they know things, Actually, they know <laughs> things, Tara, and they will tell you, <laughs> hopefully they'll do it with grace. Not always though. No. No, those those Civil War nerds are rampant. So. I know it. I know it. So the good news about all the research being destroyed in a fire, if you you know, if you can't find the research, nobody else can either. So That's there you right. go. I can make up what I want. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's so good. So um so tell me about the next one, or it maybe you're not quite ready yet. The the next one you're gonna be working on after um well you said you're in contract for your second book right now with Bethany. Yes. So can you give me a rough premise on what that's about? Yes. Yeah, so um, the the heroine of this story, her name is Elsa. She's named after my daughter. And um, we meet her in the first book in the series. She's the cousin and roommate of the protagonist of The Metropolitan Affair. And she is an ornithologist at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, she had polio as a child and she still has effects from that in her leg and her lungs. Um, at the beginning of the story, she is tasked with going to um, this woman's gothic mansion. This woman just passed away and she wants to bequeath to the museum her bird collection. So it's Elsa's mm -hmm. job to go and identify like which birds do we actually want to bring in. But the main story isn't about the birds. It's about um, the gardener and the gardener's daughter who still live at this mansion. And they have been willed a very valuable medieval manuscript, but they can't find it. They don't know where it is. And so oh, it's wow. it's a little bit of a mystery. So Elsa goes there for work, but she's also trying to help these, these people find this manuscript. And they're not the only people who want it. The family members mm. also want it. And, you know, That's danger, intrigue, romance, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All that, all that good stuff. Yeah. I love what a great prim. And I love that she had polio. I mean, it's not great that she had polio, but I'm glad because I don't see a lot of main characters, heroines, especially that you see. Polio. Right. I haven't seen that in anything in a long time, I don't think. So. Well, and the really and interesting thing to me, and this is another one of those fascinating, fascinating pieces of research, but in, also in a sad way, was that um, a lot of times with people who had polio as a child, 20 years later, they start experiencing more effects from it. 
Mm. And yeah, so, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. And so, you know, you think of someone who has survived this childhood disease and then suddenly their leg is bothering them again more and they find that they don't have the stamina that they had a few months ago and they're getting worse. Like, yeah. how do you deal with that? So yeah. that is a thread in the story. And because I want to explore for all the readers who, and, and you know a lot about this, who have chronic illness um, mm -hmm. where you yeah. don't expect to be fully healed in this life. Yeah. What do you do with that? And I, I, with my books, not every book wraps every thread up with a shiny bow where it's all happily ever after, because that's not how life works. I want all of my books to resolve and be fulfilling, but I also mm -hmm. want to show that we can be fulfilled even if we don't get the guy we thought was the man of our dreams. Um, right. That's only in one book, everybody. Don't worry. <laughs> Most of the time. They, they, you know, they get together. And the other guy had bad breath. So yes, it's, a, it's, yes. good. it's good that they're with the one they're with. Oh my gosh. You are so hilarious. You know, I think about that. I don't think I'm a very good romance writer, but one thing that stops me from letting characters kiss is I always think, when is the last time they had an opportunity to brush their teeth? So, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and what did this guy have for, have for lunch? If he had tuna fish, That's it's right. out. So we're, we're not doing that. That's right. <laughs> So I was watching The Born Identity with Matt Damon a long time ago. It's a great movie, yeah. but this poor girl, she throws up because she's so scared. And then hours later, but she hasn't brushed her teeth yet, they kiss. And I'm like, no, no, you have lost me forever. No. So I don't. Yeah. What is wrong with you? I know. These are the things I think about. Well, we're just covering a lot in this conversation, aren't we? <laughs> well, and honestly, that's that's me. Everyone who knows, I'm pretty, I'm pretty out there. Um, I'll just say what I'm thinking, which is not usually good. It's not socially appropriate, <laughs> but it's me. Um, so, uh, do you um, coach people? Do you? And I've seen that you have got like tons of speaking um, topics oh, out there. Egyptology yeah. was in there. So, how cool is that? Yeah, that's fun. I don't. Um, I don't do a lot of coaching for people. Mm -hmm. I do speak at like libraries and, and this yeah. year I've, I was at the fiction reader summit, but it was just, you know, we're all panelists. So it's not right. like I had anything special to bring. Um, what am I going to, Oh, I'm going to be one of the keynote speakers at the just read rendezvous in St. Louis on November 17th. So oh, now you got to tell me what does a fiction writer speak about in a keynote address. Hmm. I don't know. I will figure it out and you'll all be aware after November 17th, but yeah, I'm, I love it. a full calendar this year. And I, I'm very grateful, especially after the three years of COVID three oh, yes. plus years where it just killed everything. I think that yes. this is my year to like get out and travel and talk to people. And then everyone will be sick of Jocelyn green <laughs> and I'll just be here. I'll just be in my house. <laughs> It'll be fine. That has been what's going on with me. I said, I told my husband, I have flown more this year than I've probably flown in my entire life. Oh my and gosh. I think it says, and it's all writers retreats and a few women's retreats, but mostly just a lot of writers retreats. They need people to, to be advisors or to teach on, oh, cool. you know, POV, just little stuff like that. Um, but I said, I think that everyone's just in such a detriment since COVID. They're just trying to get it all in almost like they're waiting for another another epidemic to hit. It was so funny when you talk about not wanting to write about epidemics. Yeah. My family, our favorite game is this game called Pandemic. We're big board <laughs> game players. We love so Pandemic. We. Yeah. And when COVID hit, I don't think we touched that thing for like two years because we were all just like, yeah. Can't. And we wanted to because we've never yet beat the board because we're all stupid. But <laughs> We like we ha my husband said, "How can a board beat us? We're a I thought a smart group. I said clearly we're not. Yeah, so, um, it's a cooperative game, but maybe now we can pick it up and play and have a little bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. The post well, thank you so much for joining me and just your heart. Oh, and thank you. I can't wait to see what God does with with you and your writing and your encouragement in the future. Thank you. This was so much fun, Tara. Too bad we're just not in fun. person with coffee or tea. I know. Someday, I know. Someday. And we're both tea drinkers, I noticed. You said you're a tea drinker, right? Or is, I that, am. My, is that somebody else I'm mixing you up with? No, nope, yeah, okay. I am. You're a big, I'm 
I'm a big tea drinker. I talk about it a lot for some reason. <laughs> I'm I'm picky about my tea too. Are you picky? Does it have to be certain types? Um, I I enjoy. We have a local tea shop that sells all loose leaf tea, and I love it. Okay. I I will drink from tea bags when yes. the time is right for that because there is a time and a place for tea bags. But my favorites are the loose leaf. Yeah, loose leaf. That's me. my favorite of all time is the spice and tea exchange. I mm. love their tea. And I've got a problem. My husband said, I don't know what's worse, your tea collection or your books. And I said, well, oh, that kind of goes along with the they territory. They go so well <laughs> together. <laughs> Thank you. 